by the will and the breath of God. We are each of us a wondrous thing. And still, we are only shadows of the Christ, the ultimate being not made by hands, the one who is maker of the world and not made by it. Paul told the Athenians, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth life to all things, and breath and all things. And he said also, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It is clear from these scriptures and many more that our earthly bodies are the temple, the tabernacle containing the express image of God. This is where and how Jesus came to dwell in the flesh. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Where dwelt in the original is the word tabernacle. And it's translated in the message, as Claire was reading from the message this morning, as the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. We see echoes of this glory every time we celebrate Easter. We also read in the ninth chapter of Genesis that the desecration of the image of God, that tabernacle and that temple, must be atoned for by blood. We, this tells us that God's image is seriously holy. We are made to resemble him for a reason. Hebrews 1, God hath spoken to us in these last days by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus, and will, by our position in him, rule with him and share in his glory. This is not even true of the angels, wondrous and beautiful and powerful as they are. So what are our responsibilities in this matter? What does being in God's image mean? I find the biblical definition of God is love. 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So our work here on earth, as it will be in heaven, is to love. He's shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And it is stated directly by Jesus in the New Testament, the first of all commandments, is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. This is the first commandment, and the second is like unto it, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another fulfilleth the law. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. 
Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. If we are joint heirs, our inheritance is love. Love is immensely powerful. It is nurturing, generative, creative. When God commanded us to be fruitful and multiply, he had already endowed us with the supernatural power to do so. Love bonds us together in families, in communities, and in his church. Without love, we wither and perish. Now, when I was younger, loving people often brought me pain. Sometimes they died on me. Sometimes they didn't meet my expectations. Sometimes they disappointed me. I spent time instead in the natural world, in the serene beauty of God's creation. But eventually I gained the courage to love people as an outgrowth, not as an abandonment of my love for creation. And yes, they still die on me. They still disappoint me. They still possess and use their power to hurt me. I think it's happened to all of you as well. But it is still our proper work to see the image of God in the people we meet. In truth, loving people is dangerous. The only thing more dangerous is not to love at all. Oh, and, and did I say this was going to be easy? Cheap service is no honor to God. God does not ask us to do the easy thing. In truth, God doesn't have to ask us to do anything at all. What he kindly refers to as a call to his service is a command. And his will will be done. We have the option to do so grudgingly or willingly. Well, you could try the running away part, but you saw how well that worked for Jonah. Otherwise, the control over our future belongs entirely to God. All we have is permission to petition for grace to accept his will. The cost of discipleship is whatever God says it is. But the rewards are immense. Now, speaking of grudging service, there are people we find it difficult to love. We must still give them respect and live at peace with them as far as it lies within us. We can pray that they reach their potential as a child in the image of God, that Satan loses his power to put his hands over their reins. Dare we say of any human being that they are holy, irredeemably evil. Think of Judas Iscariot, Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden, Charles Roberts. As evil as their actions were, they themselves are not our enemies. You say they are unworthy. They are not the ones whose worth is to be judged. God does not create trash. Even Satan was once an angel of light, but Satan can mar, with our consent, what God has made. Our enemy is Satan, not our fellow creatures. Do you believe that Satan, the accuser, the devil in his host, attacks you, each of you, individually. He does that to all of us. The devil and his angels are and have been since the fall engaged in a war with the hosts and people of God. He attacks us in our obedience to God's commandment to love. In these days, I see an unholy arrogance in the world, a certainty that one's own point of view is so self-evidently correct 
that no other opinion is possible. No decent or right-thinking individual could believe differently. How can you even think that? There is so much polarization, or let me call it by another name, demonization, that respect and civility are not even seen as necessary or appropriate. The author of the book on listening that we've studied recently described the Pharisees as holding views in absolute certainty, bearing attitudes and expectations that cannot be overcome by what the person we are hearing actually says. Humility is not in the house. When we speak ill of someone, when you or I curl up our lips, when we wear vilifying t-shirts, when we say such and such a person doesn't deserve our respect and consideration, that they should be sent to re-education camp, when we post hateful things on Facebook, or even like the hateful things someone else posts, about people who believe differently from us, we are doing the will of Satan. Should I say that again louder? That is doing the will of Satan. Do you desire to recreate the world in your own image of wanting everyone to be like you, to think like you? Is it really your image that would perpetrate? Or is it the father of lies? Of course, we may lawfully disagree with each other. Of course, we may try to persuade someone that our point of view is more correct. Of course, we may restrict someone when their actions endanger another person or are contrary to God's law. But when our disagreements over thoughts and opinions become denigrations of their character and humanity, when we consider them subhuman and that Jesus did not love and die for them, then we deny the presence of God and the Holy Spirit in that person. That is blasphemy, and that is wrong. How can you despise and wish all manner of harm to one of God's children, thereby glorifying Satan in your heart, and then expect to look God in the face. You know, there's an expression that they use of people who, who spew forth profanity and foul language. You kiss your mother with that mouth? We are not here to judge our brothers and sisters. Our work, our privilege as a forgiven child of God is to love our brothers and sisters, to respect them, to acknowledge their right to hold their opinions, whatever beliefs they hold as a matter between them and God, in whose image they were created no less than you. I offer you the word of God in Romans 14. As for the man who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not for disputes over opinions. One believes he may eat anything, while the weak man eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who abstains, and let not him who abstains pass judgment on him who eats, for God has welcomed him. One man esteems one day as better than another. While another man esteems all days alike, let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while he who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Let me interject here. It is not the content of the belief that matters. What matters is that the belief is held unto the Lord. Even contradictory beliefs 
are held unto the Lord. Who are you to judge someone's servant, someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for Lord is able to make them stand. You then, why do you judge your brother and sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God. So then each of you will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Therefore, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. What is there to add to the word? You are made in the image of God. You are cherished and beloved and holy. So am I. So are your neighbors and even your enemies. The command of the Lord is to love as you love yourself. If you feel you have failed in this, Sinning against God and man? The remedy is as close at hand as the cross, and the reparation is near as your neighbor. We are all in the image of God. It is our honor and our task to love, as he who created us is love. But I will give you a word of advice. God does not deal in hypothetical questions. If he gives you an insight a grace of understanding, pay attention, you're going to need it later. And that grace is not limited. It's not rationed out. It's not far away. We close with another verse. Reach out your hand if your cup be empty. If your cup is full, may it be again. Let it be known there is a fountain that is not made by the hands of men. Lord our God, keep us in your will. Remind us daily with every person we meet that your image is what we are looking for. Amen.